Canto 8 of The Paradise takes us into the next and new sphere of heaven and it helped me reflecting on this to think about how it represents a discontinuity from the sphere of Mercury that Dante discovers he's now left. But also there's continuity as well because some of the themes with which he'd been wrestling in the mercurial sphere continue for sure only now with his different awareness with his different consciousness he's able to see them in a different light and so penetrate more deeply into the conundrums which is to say he's able to see more deeply into reality more of the divine nature more of the divine light and that is what it is to ascend so for example whereas Justinian had raised the business of earthly principalities and powers Dante is able now to see more clearly how those principalities and powers on earth can become aligned with the principalities and powers in heaven he's able to see more freely what our freedom is about as well and how our freedom becomes um, more extensive when actually we align our loves in life with the love of heaven which is to say that rather than pursuing the kind of epicycles of our own desire we learn to swing more and more with the great circle you might say of the divine love um, to orientate ourselves around the deepest centre which is both the deepest centre inside ourselves inside the cosmos and of course ultimately is the deeper center which is God in God's self and I think he also sees something more about the incarnation and what that might mean for us as individuals what it is to bridge the mortal and the immortal and that happens when in our individuality we learn to pursue our desires but also discern them because it's our particular loves in life that actually are the distinctive path that we each must follow to discover the divine love. So it's not love seen as an amorphous activity that is pretty much the same regardless of who is carrying it out. Um, a, a limited notion, say, of charity as always helping, always giving. Um, rather there's something very distinctive and particular, individual, about the love that we must discover to follow this ascent towards the divine. And I think that also is a moment to mention how the sphere that Dante finds himself suddenly in, without having consciously travelled there, is the sphere of Venus, is the sphere of the goddess of love. But it's love not as is often taken to be, certainly in the Christian circles that I know, which has this rather um, mono-dimensional quality, um, as if you know love always is just giving, um, love is kind of familiar and well known to us. Um, this canto can sort of stir us up again and make us think again about what love might be, because this is love in the medieval sense, this is Venus, in her planetary form which was as much so associated say with fortunate events on earth um, as it was with straightforward um, love of God um, it's about blessings in the richest sense there's also different forms of Venus which would have been present in Dante's mind there's the more earthly manifestations of Venus which is to do with generation reproduction um, one of the themes, in fact, of this canto, um, and then the heavenly Venus, which is much more about sharing in the co-creativity of the divine um, in your own life, making manifest um, God's life. Um, so there's quite a mix, um, and it's worth bearing that in mind when you read the canto, because otherwise the canto can be quite confusing um, when you kind of are looking for more familiar notions of love. Dante finds himself in this sphere, um, he says quite explicitly, um, without consciously having travelled there, 
um, this is him saying now more and more clearly that traveling through these different spheres of the heavens is in fact opening onto deeper awareness of reality. And I think that the deeper awareness of reality which his mind's eye has shared in, in Mercury, right at the end of Canto 7, is the perception that, well, the particular instance was that rather than Christ's life focusing around the cross as a kind of divine interruption or intervention into things, and so putting things right that way, and rather he saw that the significance of Christ's life was the incarnation itself, which is a continuation or an amplification of God's engagement with creation, which is the outpouring, the unfolding of life. So he's arrived at a more harmonious vision of how reality works, without losing touch of how the incarnation was also a particular moment in history. Um, and it's that bringing together of the particular and the universal in a more harmonious vision that means he's now capable of seeing how those things come together and so can leave behind the more dialectical, tricksterish sphere of Mercury and enter this new sphere of Venus. So it's a clue for us as to what ascent might be on Earth. It's about perceiving the deeper harmonies through the apparent disruptions and even contradictions. In a way, I think Dante gives us a sense of that by the way he opens Canto 8, because it begins with a description almost of how Venus might have been seen in the ancient pagan polytheistic world, where she was seen as, Dante the poet puts it, as throwing out frenzied beams of love, causing confusion, um, entrancing people through her son Cupid. Um, he mentions Dido, which, if you remember before, um, had been remembered as the woman who died for her love of Aeneas, um, but not in the sense of entering into um, deeper life, but giving up on life. Venus is also remembered as the evening and morning star, wooing the sun um, at nape and brow, sometimes leading the sun into the day, sometimes following the sun into the night. And that's a rather beautiful image that Venus has this relationship dancing around the sun who can stand for the divine unity. And I think part of what Dante's doing with these various images in the opening of the canto is showing us how he's leading us into a new sense of how love works that is moving from the polyethic, polytheistic epicycles, as he put it, the kind of different spins and motions um, in a multi-godded cosmos, to the insight of monotheism, which actually that all these different dynamics, all these different motions can actually, with deeper sight, be seen to be revolving round the one centre in a multivalent harmony. Um, and, and this, of course, is also to gain the sight that Paolo and Francesca didn't have in the Inferno, um, who too were moved and whirled around by love, but it was their love that didn't have a centre. It was instead focused on each other, and so didn't have that wider orientating point. So discerning that deeper groundedness, that deeper rootedness, that deeper compass of love is been signalled already as a main focus for this new sphere and this new moment of perception at the beginning of Canto 8. Immediately Dante sees that the souls are behaving differently too. They're described as dressing themselves in the light of this sphere, whereas if you remember before Justinian's light had been seen to be in some kind of competition or at least um, Justinian who confused his earthly light, his earthly glory, with divine light and glory. Um, one of the souls that Dante meets now in Canto 8 is described as spinning itself a cocoon of silk, much like the worm spins the cocoon of silk. Um, and so they're much more consciously putting on divine light in their own lives. Um, so that's another aspect that this deeper awareness or perception gives them. They can more consciously participate in the divine life, you know, which is to say to become more consciously incarnations of the divine. 
So you get these little hints and nudges in Dante's descriptions which show us what this deeper perception, this deeper sphere awareness of reality and therefore deeper part of reality itself is all about. He notices that Beatrice is shining with greater beauty now. Um, he's able to look at this, to take it in. Um, really this is about him seeing more of Beatrice's divine beauty. Again, he's moving into a new sphere. And he notices too how souls come rushing towards him in this sphere. They're described as descending from the high heavens, from the sphere of the seraphim. And that gives us much more an explicit sense of why souls are seen in this particular realm. They're out of their generosity, out of their love, coming to show Dante part of themselves, which was what shaped what they became capable of in their mortal lives, to help Dante. But clearly now coming down from the high heavens, where they also know the divine life as well. So you've got that mix made much more explicitly here in Venus because Dante can see how souls can know different parts of the heavens without compromising their delight in God. And delight, gorgeousness, joy characterises these souls' appearance around him. It's even quite erotic. Um, they want to give themselves. Um, one of the souls stands forward and says, we want you to share in the greatest joy of us. There's a sense of life interpenetrating here, um, which has quite an erotic feel. Now characterised by sharing, giving, outpouring, rather than the old Eros, which Dante had confronted in Purgatory, which was much more about possessing and capturing, abducting. Um, so this is the kind of erotic joy that can carry him into the higher heavens. And he looks to Beatrice in a lovely, touching moment. She gives his blessing to speak now to this one soul who has stepped forward. And he asks, who are you? Uh, maybe meaning both who you are you, particular soul, but who are you, um, souls sharing this zone of reality? Um, Dante wants to know more, and he wants to become more consciously participative of this new sphere. And what follows for quite a fair amount of the canto um, is this soul describing who he is. Um, he never actually gives his name. Um, Dante doesn't see his features either. Um, he's sharing that bit more in the divine life. Um, but we know that he is an earthly manifestation of power and principality. He was a prince on earth because he says that I share in the sphere of heaven partly because I share in the vitality of the angelic powers and principalities, the kind of heavenly correspondent of the powers on earth. And he describes at great length where his rule extended um, in various parts of um, southern Europe. Um, and it's very touching and warm towards Dante. So the implication is that Dante immediately recognises him when he actually starts speaking. Um, he feels the warmth of this soul within himself. And so Dante knows that it is actually the figure of Charles, Charles Martel, who was a king of Hungary, who we know stayed in Florence, and Dante must have got to know him there, but known him as a kindred spirit, um, as much as a visiting ruler. And so the sense is that now their meeting here in the heaven of Venus is really joyful. And in fact, when Charles stops speaking, Dante describes his joy, describes his delight, and says how it's even more amplified now he's here meeting Charles in heaven as opposed to in Florence because he knows that Charles sees clearly his delight and moreover he knows that the delight that he feels on meeting Charles is a direct echo and reflection of the divine delight and so their, share, their friendship is in fact shown to be a sharing in the divine love, the divine light um, their friendship was actually a love that turned around the divine centre and so it gives Dante all the more pleasure to meet Charles again here now. Um, again a nice 
illustration for us of how we can know that deeper love here on earth in friendship um, when the love that we might share with a friend can be felt to be turning around a deeper love um, which is um, the divine love and friendship is a really crucial kind of love um, as well as erotic love and as well as charitable love as well a lot of the the multiple manifestations of love um, that Dante is now fully experiencing however during his revealing of himself Charles had also mentioned his brother Robert who was another ruler but wasn't at all a fortunate blessing for his subjects as Charles had been um, he had as Charles said a stingy nature and so had been corrupted on earth and got into with bad sorts um, and it's a bit of a jolt for Dante you know how come this other name has been evoked here in the sphere of heaven um, one who doesn't fit with the blessings of Venus um, but it turns out to be a gift to even that disruptive name Robert can be brought into harmony here in Venus because it's a chance for Dante to learn more about the conundrums that had first awoken for him in Mercury and in fact Charles says um, that which is behind your back can now be put in front of you here in Venus and these questions of freedom and the individual can be um, addressed once more um, with more clarity and it comes about because what Dante says is that actually a new question has arisen for him which is how the same family and the same seed can produce such disparate characters such disparate souls you know even two brothers can one be aligned with the divine whilst the other clearly is not um, and this is to revisit a question now that has emerged several times um, casting it now in more light um, which is this business of how we human beings are made you know how can it be that we can be free incarnations of the divine when clearly parts of our nature are determined um, our physical nature um, our inheritance we would now put it in terms of genes Dante puts it in terms of family so they discuss this now and in summary what Dante sees is that the things that shape our life don't actually limit our life but instead can become the pathway through our life by which we find the greater life and our freedom comes in discerning this pathway becoming more aligned to it and it's a kind of freedom because actually that which shapes us is at root when seen most deeply part of our deepest desires so discerning those deepest loves in life finding our vocation would be another way of putting it finding that which if we revolve around actually brings to greatest fruition all that we are given all that we've inherited um, because of our time and place and so on um, and because it's the fulfillment of our greatest desires when we've discern them aright actually also makes for a deeply satisfying life here on earth as well as being our way of capturing sight of the divine life here on earth which actually at the end of the day is what it is to lead a satisfying life here on earth is to take our particularities to hone them and work them and amplify them enlarge them to enjoy and delight in them and to see that that can become an echo, a reflection of the divine life. And in that way, we fulfill what is the general human task in our particular way, which is bridging that which is mortal and immortal, that which is human and divine, that which is particular and universal. This could also be said to be part of the Venus spirit within us, that much as Venus the planet is seen to both lead and herald the sun at the beginning of the day as well as follow and leave an echo of the beauty of the sun at the end of the day when she's the morning and the evening star 
So too our lives can be a bit like Venus in relation to the Sun, if the Sun stands for the one divine God. Um, we can hope by honing the beauty of our own souls um, to both be a morning and an evening star. And of course, Christ himself has been described as the morning star um, that awakens us to a new dawn. So there's lovely complex layers revealing a deeper harmony in the illusions that we're getting here in Canto 8. And there are practical benefits to this complex harmony as well, because as Charles also points out to Dante, the fact that there are many and different paths to God means that there can be diversity on earth, but that diversity needn't just descend into chaos, but can form a social order that then is good for everybody. And because, as Dante freely admits, it's better to live in an ordered society on earth than one that has got plunged into chaos, um, the society that actually Dante knew in his life through the civil wars and how terrible that truly is. This is about how individuals can be different but also equal, how they can fulfil their roles as a particular person, you know, born a man, born a woman, uh, born in a particular country, in a particular time and place. Um, and the reason why difference and equality can go together under this vision is because our differences lead to an equality that's found actually not directly here on earth, but is found in our, what you might call our divine double, um, that, as it were, exists in heaven, and that the particularities of life here on earth are identity, um, our differences are the ways that we find a pathway to that equally shared life in heaven. And it's worth noting, I think, also that this isn't just a vision that is a kind of conservative reassertion of a hierarchical society where each person knows their place and tries to find their life in that place. And because Charles has said that his brother, Robert, failed in this way. And so this is about finding something deeper within ourselves than just what we're given, but rather taking what we're given finding the divine aspect of that within us and so being able to reach more and more into life in all its fullness. It's an expansion of life rather than a constraint of life. That's precisely the difference that Dante is now able to see here in heaven. And so the vision that unfolds before him is very much like the souls that he sees whirling around him. They're flames that we can imagine, each in a way having its own distinctiveness, even as Dante realises that they're moving with the one love, the one life. He's seen this in the delight of meeting his friend Charles and realising that the delight that's shared between them as friends, as particular individuals. You know, we want our friends to be particular individuals. That's why it's very different from romantic love when we want to merge with our beloved. And so that particularity and difference is being seen quite clearly here by Dante in Venus, even as he realises that they're also equally sharing in the one love, the centre of all things.